Find a quiet place to be with God as the lights go down. And imagine that the lights above are stars. As John baptized new converts, he invited them to live with changed hearts and lives. When asked how to do that, his answers all point to making sure that no one is cheated or left without basic necessities of life, including the right not to be harassed, a life full of joy, which the prophet Isaiah describes as an ever-flowing spring. This is the birthright of all children of God. May we act to make it so. Joy waits for us at Advent. Joy waits for us to sing. Joy waits for our amazement at the grace in everything in this time of prayer. Today we offer the light of joy, a pink candle, to illumine the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May joy awaken us to the possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a house for the holy. Joy waits for us at Advent. Joy for us to sing and joy waits for our amazement at the grace in everything in this time of preparation for the work of co-creation for the birthing of a world where wonder is restored woman who lives near me. She may be 70. She may be closer to 80. It's hard to tell. She lives in a sleeping bag on the sidewalk, just off a curb at the entrance to an alley. And every morning she reads aloud from a soiled red leather Bible, with the letter O missing from the word holy, and the letter E missing from the word Bible. And when she isn't reading from her Bible, she hums. One morning, trying to make some kind of connection, I stopped and asked her what the song was she was humming. She said, it's a song about me waiting. Curious, I asked, what is it you're waiting for? She said, I'm waiting for my sign to come. I'm living here where I've heard people say, there's a stoplight, and I'm waiting for the red to turn green. I'm waiting for all those who think they can thrive on hating to be healed by a bomb in Gilead. I'm waiting for those who live in fear to know how to let fear go and breathe in new life. I'm waiting for the families who are unable to celebrate anybody's birthday, anybody's mother, anybody's child. I'm sitting here waiting for them to get the lives they are meant to live just because they're here. I'm waiting for the old who don't know it already to know that they're loved waiting for those who believed they failed to know it's all right to begin again, waiting for those who swear they'll never forgive to come to understand what forgiveness truly means. My songs, an old gospel song, used to sing it way back. 
changed it up a little in honor of my waiting. It says, because the Lord is my shepherd, I'll have everything I need. He'll let me rest in the meadow's grass and he'll lead me beside the quiet stream. He'll restore my failing health and he'll help me to do what honors God the most. That's why I know I'll be safe. That's why I will be safe in God's arms. She said, everything I'm waiting for will come because they that wait shall run and not be weary. They are going to have their strength renewed. So I'm gonna wait. I'm living here where they tell me there's a stoplight, but I'm gonna sit right here and pray and hum and wait till the red turns to green. of Luke. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, 
and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he may, might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Emmanuel. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy and loving one, help us to prepare a way for Christ to be born in our hearts so that we might go out into the world and be a part of what you are doing to create a more just world. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my parents are in town, and it's got me thinking about some of my favorite holiday traditions growing up. We started preparing for Christmas the day after Thanksgiving. We would go and pick out the perfect tree at a Christmas tree farm that a couple in our church owned. And I remember going and finding the perfect tree, and then we would go and take it to my dad's orange Chevy Astro hatchback. And the seats would fold down, and we would somehow get that Christmas tree in that hatchback car and drive it home. That's one of my earliest memories, riding with the Christmas tree on the way home. Then we would get it there, and we would set it up in front of our large picture window in our front room. My dad would string the lights around the Christmas tree, and my mom would take out the ornaments that she had meticulously packed away the year before. She loves Hallmark ornaments. And then I would take them out and start decorating the tree. And once my brother was born, he would start helping. And then my dad would come and put the star or the angel, whatever we were using that year, on the top of the tree. And we'd flip on the lights, and our front house would be uh, aglow. That front window would be aglow. Then we would go and we would take the stockings and we'd place them above the fireplace. It was a beautiful tradition. I love that. I bet many of you have traditions that you use each year to help prepare you for Christmas. And indeed, we have traditions here at University Christian Church that help prepare us for the season. I was thinking on Friday night when we were having cocktails and carols at Uptown, how wonderful it was to be able to be in person for that this year and not singing on Zoom. That was a wonderful tradition to be able to resume. We had Christmas carols with Paul Svensson this year. Under normal circumstances, we might go out into the community and do Christmas caroling or have the disciples' women tea. We always have our Advent candles, hope, peace, joy, and love. Sometimes we have a wreath, sometimes we bring them in, as we have been doing this year. And we always have the choir Christmas presentation and the children's program. We also have Christmas Eve. All those things help to prepare the way, help us to get ready for Christmas. 
And doesn't that make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside just thinking about that? All these wonderful traditions, thinking about Christmas, how joyful it is. And then comes John the Baptist, and he has this message for us. Repent, you brood of vipers! The kingdom of God is at hand! Read the room, John. We're trying to get our hearts ready for Christmas. We're trying to be joyful. We're embracing all of these wonderful traditions, and here he is. Repent! The kingdom of God is at hand. We skipped over that portion in today's reading, but he does say it. Repent! The kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist, always causing problems. Do you ever notice this? We also didn't read today the physical description of John, but you remember it, don't you? He's a wide-eyed, wild-haired, camel hair-wearing, focused and wild, honey-eating wilderness prophet. He's uh, kind of out there. In fact, there's not really much of a reason we should remember him at all. I mean, he doesn't have any uh, official authority. He's just a, a country preacher. And people wondered who on earth John the Baptist was. Who was this guy? Who is John the Baptist? Some people thought maybe he was Elijah. If you've spent much time with the Hebrew Bible at all, you might remember that Elijah is portrayed as not having died, but went up to heaven on a chariot of fire. Remember this? And so there began to be a tradition that developed that perhaps before the Messiah could come, Elijah would need to return. And the belief was so strong that at dinner tables, people would even leave an open chair for Elijah, just in case he might come and a new age might be ushered in. Was John the Baptist Elijah? People wondered. Well, according to the Gospel of Luke, from which we read this morning, Jesus and John the Baptist are related traditionally. They're second cousins. But it doesn't say that anywhere else outside of Luke, nor does it say it outside of the Bible. So it's probably true that Luke used this as a, a narrative device, as a way to tie Jesus and John together from the very beginning, even before they were born, so that John could jump in utero to prophesy Jesus. But regardless of whether or not they were related, it is undeniable that John and Jesus had interconnected lives. Who is John the Baptist? And what kind of Baptist is he anyway? I mean, is he a Southern Baptist, American Baptist, Cooperative Baptist, Progressive Baptist? What kind of Baptist is John the Baptist? John the Baptist. You know, John got himself into trouble uh, because he had this message, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the way he went about proclaiming that was, he said, you know, the whole temple stuff, you don't need to worry about that. Don't bother going to the temple. He circumvented the temple authorities, and people didn't really like that. You see, there was money to be made in the whole God business and the whole temple game, and they didn't want people saying, don't go to the temple. Remember, Jesus got mad about this later in his life. He went and he overturned the money changer tables. Remember that? So John's out in the wilderness, and he's saying, hey, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. You know what that means? You ever thought about that? Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Well, repent doesn't mean what we typically think it means today, you know, to feel bad, to feel sorry, to be penitent. No, in ancient Judaism, it only had two meanings. The first was to be in exile and to return from exile to the path of God. To return from exile to the path of God, that's to repent. And the second meaning that it had was literally to go beyond the mind that you have to go beyond the mind that you have. So, return to the path of God and be open-minded. And then, the kingdom of God is at hand. God is near. Return to the path of God, open your mind, for God is near. He said, that's all you need. I'll baptize you with, with water, but this is what we're doing, returning to the path of God and opening our minds, preparing for God to come. He says in today's scripture lesson, 
I baptize you with water, but there's someone coming who's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Get ready. The Pharisees didn't like that. They were the religious legalists of the day. The Sadducees didn't like it either. They were the ones who controlled the temple. And you know, if, if John had left it there, if he had just criticized the temple folks, that probably would have been okay. But John, you, you can probably tell this, uh, uh, John didn't know when to keep his mouth shut. And John started criticizing the political leaders of the day. He started to criticize Herod Antipas. Now this isn't the Herod from the birth stories, it's his son, Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas. And Herod responded by having John arrested. And Herod also had a wife, and John frequently criticized Herod's wife, and that got him into deeper trouble because Herod's wife had an opinion on what should happen to John the Baptist. He should be beheaded, and he was. This was an effort, of course, to stop John's movement, stop this country preacher out in the wilderness, baptizing people, telling people they didn't need the temple, telling uh, people that they ought to be loyal to God over the Roman Empire. We want to put a stop to all that. But here's the thing. It, it didn't stop it, right? Now, regardless of whether you believe Jesus and, and John were related to one another is uh, irrelevant, uh, because Jesus and John were connected. I think that Jesus was initially a follower of John the Baptist, that his message spoke to Jesus. It's up to you whether you believe that or not, but I think it's logical. That's what happens. That's why you would get baptized by someone, right? You would go and you would listen to them. You'd be moved by what they were saying. And so I think whenever John was beheaded, Jesus picked up the mantle of John the Baptist. He continued that ministry, but he changed it in a fundamental way. Remember John's message, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Return to the path of God, open your mind, God is near. Jesus changed it to this. Repent, return to the path of God, open your mind, for God is here, right? Not near, not coming, God is here now. And listen to this. There's a, a verse later in Luke where Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of God is within you. You know this verse? The kingdom of God is within you. And another way to translate that is the kingdom of God, the realm of God is in your midst. God is both within and around you. God is here. Did you listen to today's scripture lesson and think, that sounds a whole lot like Jesus. The, the stuff that he was asking people to do, to, to give away their cloaks, uh, to focus on what they have, to not take too much. Their messages were very similar, but Jesus's was fundamentally different because he wasn't saying that we are waiting for something. He was saying that God is in the here and now, and we are called to be co-creators with God in bringing the realm of God to this earth. And that is incredibly powerful. And at least for me on Joy Sunday, that gives me a great amount of joy to think about the fact that God is here right now and is inviting us to be a part of what God is doing in the world. It's incredibly powerful, isn't it? God calls each and every one of us to be a part of the work that is going on, to recognize that God is here within us and all around us. Theologians call this the already not yet kingdom of God, the reign of God. It's, it's kind of here. We realize it in some instances by how we act. Hopefully, if we act well in church, we get to see a little manifestation of the reign of God whenever we come together. Hopefully, whenever we go and follow teachings of Jesus out in the world, we get to see a little bit of the kingdom of God, but it's not yet fully realized. It's the already not yet kingdom of God. And so here's the thing, we are called to be co-creators of God, to realize these places in our lives where God is present, to feel those places of joy where God's presence feels overwhelming to us, and then to go out into the world and help to create a world in which there is peace, there is justice, where there is that hope, that joy, that love that we talk about all Advent made manifest out in the world. 
So friends, isn't that a joyful thing to be a part of, to be a part of what God is doing in the world? Let's let God reside in our hearts and let's go out into the world and share the good news. May it be so. Amen.